Okay, so what you need to know is we're in the book of Jeremiah. We are entering into chapter 7. You also need to know the book that of Jeremiah a is a clarion theme call and or verse in chapter 7 is verse 11. And the reason why it's central is because it was a focus or frame, like the framework of a zeal that consumed Jesus for his father's house. So when he made the statement about the temple being turned into a den of thieves, and it was supposed to be a house of prayer, he pulled it from an Isaiah verse, and right here in Jeremiah chapter seven. What did he do multiple times going into the temple? He purged his father's house. He overturned tables. He removed the money exchangers. He was doing something physically that has an application spiritually. His church is his temple. His Holy Spirit fills his people. So we have to give him access from time to time to overthrow some things up in here that are in the way of his Holy Spirit. This is his temple. Your life, your body, a temple of the Holy Spirit also should give God full access to overthrow some, some things from time to time. Like, Lord, I've made too much out of this and we just sang a song, did we not? Can you bring us back to the heart of worship? So I give our God permission to purge his church. Now remember, so far, six chapters, really the calling of a prophet named Jeremiah at a very crucial time in Judah's history. We can summarize what we've learned to date in this statement, that a nation, a people, will rise or they will fall based on whether or not they follow God's law. Really, that's what it comes down to. Interestingly, out of Psalm chapter 33, verses 10 to 12, the word of the Lord declared, listen to this, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Stop. That's a statement that transcends a time, a people, and a place. To have God's counsel, God's purpose, God's law be applicable to all generations, his heart, his purpose will stand. That's not just for the nation of Israel. Q verse 12, the verse that you know. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the people. A nation is a collection of its people whose God is the Lord. Notice the clarity. Whose God, because there were a lot of gods being worshiped, but this God who blesses a people is the Lord. Adonai, Jehovah. This is the Lord of the Bible. What you cannot do is separate the Lord from the law of any land. The government of any people in any place in any time, you can't separate the Lord from the law. When a nation tries to separate God from government, you begin to see the undoing of those people. Everything that would have an absolute truth to it begins to erode when you push God out of it. No matter a history, no matter the pride of religiosity, if the counsel of the Lord does not frame a government, the government of the church, the government of the land, if it's not the counsel of the Lord that frames the government, here's what you have. A people opening themselves up to judgment, the book of Jeremiah. Is that not the case for our land today. Now, chapter seven is a crucial chapter in what we'll call the chronology of Jeremiah so far. It's really hard to place dates on the chapters. A lot of historians and commentators have tried. What you can do is line up the sermons and the messaging. Some of them are similar. For example, in a later chapter, you're gonna get some of the similar content from chapter seven. Was it the same sermon, just written twice in the book, or was it a sermon that he delivered twice 
at two different times. I've done that before, by the way. Took out an old outline, looked at it with fresh eyes, infused it with fresh content, but the bullets were the same. Maybe that's what he did. But what happens here and why it's unique is because he changes location. Prior to, where did the Lord send him? Go out into the community, go out into the city, go to Jerusalem. And he was sent to these various locations with a word from the Lord. Here in chapter seven, he is now sent to a specific location, namely the gates of the temple. And not just sent to the gates of the temple, you gotta understand, the temple was the epicenter of Jewish life. The temple, it was located in Judah, southern Israel. The political identity of the Jew revolved around the temple. The national identity of the Jew, temple. The religious prestige of the Jew, the temple. God says to Jeremiah, verse one, chapter seven, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, that's like the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. All right, stop. He sent to a specific location, the gates of the temple. At a specific time, a lot of commentators agree when he's sent here, it's likely one of the Jewish holidays or feasts, meaning this is a very important time where a lot of people are gonna be gathering. Can I kind of give you an example? It'd be as if God sent a pastor, a minister, into the walkway. Go stand in the walkway, Matt, okay. But do it on Christmas Eve, which is gonna yield the most attendance. And when people are coming in <laughs> to the service, say this to them, amend your ways. To which if I did that here, somebody would go, what'd you say to me? I would say, am I in your way? Because I don't wanna offend anybody. I mean, how would that land as you're walking in on a Thursday night, I'm in that sally port out there telling you, repent, amend your ways, turn around. Like that, we're gonna be so like turned off by that, aren't we? But this is what Jeremiah is tasked to do. The temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. What is that? It was as if this refrain being echoed was useful to the Jew as a talisman or a lucky charm or a rabbit foot. At times, especially in times of national disaster, they would hide behind the temple. They believed there's no way God would deal with them or judge them because that's where the temple was. They hid literally behind the temple, but the temple was the scene where there was a lot of commotion and what Jeremiah is saying to the people, God isn't interested in your activity. What God is interested in it is your spiritual productivity. Not about the outward commotion because in this place, at this time, there's no inward conviction. Oh, they're still sacrificing to the Lord. They're still having service. The seats are full, but here the prophet of the Lord, the one that nobody's listening to, is the only one that's speaking the word of the Lord. The only one that's doing the work of the Lord was the one that they wanted to persecute. They believed the temple and what it stood for and how it was built, and of course the many verses that talk about the sacred nature of the temple, that as long as the temple was there, they had nothing to worry about. Ironically, or should I say prophetically, or should I say scripturally, the temple was destroyed two times. The first time connected to this time period. Who was coming to judge the Jews? Babylon. Not long after Jeremiah's ministry, 
Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, they did come. They sacked Jerusalem, the capital. They destroyed the temple in 586 BC. The unthinkable occurred. God brought his people into Babylonian captivity. It was there where he began to purge them from religiosity. Think about that. He had to lock them up to set them free. And that would come through Daniel, as we know it, that ministry. The second time, the temple would be destroyed because it was rebuilt by the favor of a pagan king, a couple of them, Cyrus, Artaxerxes, Persian pagan kings. God would move on their hearts to favor his people, to send them back to Jerusalem to do what? Rebuild the temple. So what are they rebuilding? Their identity, their heritage, their religiosity, their pride. And what happens? They push God out of the house all over again. So who shows up as the actual temple of God himself? Jesus Christ. And he prophesies based on the disciples looking at this monstrosity of a structure. It was impressive, ladies and gentlemen. When you do your research on it, there's nothing like it especially the first temple. The second temple, it lacked a little bit of the, the impressive stature of it, but it still was impressive. And the disciples said to Jesus, look at this place. They were amazed at the buildings. They stood in awe. And Jesus, if you remember, in Matthew 24 said, not a single stone will be left on top of one another. Not a single stone. Like, you're impressed by the building? And in the process of being impressed by the building, you missed my very being, is what Jesus was saying. In 70 AD, as Jesus predicted, about 40 years after his ministry, the Romans would destroy the temple, leaving not a single stone upon the next. What happened then? The Jews were scattered abroad globally. Their land was in shambles, and yet God was purging his people. And what brought them back to the land? A prophecy fulfilled, May 14th, 1948. The trauma and tragedy known as the Holocaust. Again, God would bring good out of evil in the rebirth of his people. Why is that significant? Because I look at it from temple to temple. From 70 AD and the temple being destroyed to present day, The Temple Institute right now, as I speak, is currently attempting to rebuild the third temple, which has biblical proportions attached to it because they're waiting for the Messiah for the first time to come. And it's interesting when this figure shows up on the scene that we know is the Antichrist, they're gonna receive him with open arms as if he is the Christ. And he's gonna go into the temple They're gonna engage in sacrifice again. National pride will be on the rise. Of course, the Antichrist turns on them after three and a half years, to which Daniel's prophecy about the seven years that are outstanding in his prophecy will be fulfilled. That is the time of Jacob's trouble. By the way, we'll read about that in Jeremiah, the time of Jacob's trouble. Recently, people are sending me articles, I read about it, about the red heifers, Did you read about that? Being bred and sent over to Israel. The red heifer is actually what they would sacrifice to bring a purity to some of the priests that would be able to be useful in the future temple. It's interesting. Guess where those heifers were bred? In the country of Texas. (laughs) Texas, America. A Christian farmer. I digress, but it's interesting to me to see that this guy is contributing to the Temple Institute to see if these red heifers, which are very rare, will stand the test of time to be useful to the eventual construction of the third temple. It is unbelievable to live in a time today. You wanna live in Bible times, you're living in them. Okay, what's my point about all of that? This is what God is after. To God, it's not about being religious. To God, it's about being righteous. 
I remember several years ago, I was tasked with preaching on Christmas Eve. And as previously said, that would be a very well-attended service with people that would only frequent church maybe two times a year, okay. And the Lord laid on my heart a passage in Galatians, and as I teased it out about the arrival of Jesus Christ, I came to a certain point, and the point was this, that it's easy to adore baby Jesus. That's what Christmas Eve is all about, little baby Jesus. But you'll never understand the gift of baby Jesus until you come face to face with bloody Jesus. I don't care how beautiful the tradition is that cuddles baby Jesus, oh, with his mother Mary. Because if you don't encounter bloody Jesus on that cross, you'll never understand baby Jesus, the depth of what it took God to subject himself to humanity. Soon after that message, somebody came up to me and they were offended because they brought family members. They brought family members and they were turned off by the message. They wanted a religious message. They were offended by a righteous message. And I don't apologize. One, I am not the one that saves any man. That is the Holy Spirit. And he'll use a shallow message or he'll use a deep message. And here's the point, verse five, for if you thoroughly amend your ways, this is Jeremiah on behalf of the Lord and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, up to that point, all of these corrections are manward, neighbor to neighbor. Did you get that? He's like, you are running amok and you're not dealing with your neighbor in a proper way. But then we get into how they are walking after other gods to their own hurt. And any other god in this world, and there are none but one, but we worship gods, plural, or we sacrifice on the altars of other gods and goddesses unaware, it's always to our own demise. It's to our own hurt. Anything that we pursue outside of Christ will eventually turn on us in the form of shame or pain. That's what sin promises. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place. If you amend, God is saying, if you repent, I will relent. I will allow you to stay where you are in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, ready? Forever and ever. You know what that term means? That means the land that God gave his people is still the people that God gave it to. Israel is still God's chosen land. Jerusalem is still his eternal capital. He's not done with the Jews. That's Romans chapters 9 to 11, and that's a lot of prophecies, and that's why we keep an eye on Israel. But here's what's going on here. They said they believed, the Jews, but they were deceived. Because how could they come to a place that was sacred, the temple, and yet live outside the gates completely contrary to what they said they believed? because it's not about just believing. I thought it was. No, no. James chapter two, verse 19 says, even the demons, what? Yeah. Even the demons believe and tremble. But they don't have an obedient belief. They don't have a saving faith. And the reason why this is important is because if what you believe does not affect how you behave, then what you say you believe, you don't actually believe. That's crazy. Because for a long time in my life, I said I believed. But how I behaved was contrary to what I said I believed. Therefore, what I believed, I didn't really believe. Are you getting that? 1 John chapter 2, verses four to six. He who says, ready, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The influence of that life is not truth. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. What perfects the love of God in a man or a woman? 
keeping his word, loving his word. Why his word? Well, when you love God's word, you love the word who became flesh because it's in the word that the word who became flesh is fleshed out. The person of Jesus is fleshed out in the word of God. Therefore, I pursue Christ in his word. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Question, how did Jesus walk? Answer, the Bible tells you so. Question, how did Jesus talk? Answer, the Bible tells you so. What would Jesus do? Not a question. I know what Jesus did. The Bible tells me so. It's not a mystery. And if he lives in me as his temple, then here's the equation. Those who believe in God, in Christ, will behave godly. I did not say will behave perfectly. Okay, there's a huge difference. We're not about perfect Christianity here. There is no such thing. But godly Christianity which means there's a lifestyle that pursues Jesus. I am not speaking about a form of godliness. I'm speaking about being formed by godliness. A form of godliness that lacks its power, according to what Paul wrote, that's religion, outward, external. This is what the people were about, external religiosity. Jeremiah 7, 8 to 10, he continues, behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Of course, Lies never bring profit. Lies bring debt. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods, there it is again, whom you do not know? Idolatry was rampant. Verse 10, look what they did. And then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Now, whether or not they actually said that, we're delivered to do whatever we want, it was implied on how they lived. In other words, they sacrificed for their sins in the temple. That was alive and well. They sacrificed for their sins in the temple, and then they left the temple and sinned sacrificially. They were reckless in how they lived their life, but they could come to the temple and declare, ready? I'm saved by God's grace. God's grace is enough. And it is. This is where we misunderstand God's grace. God's grace is not a license to sin. In fact, the proper understanding of God's grace is that it gives me full access to him. So I come boldly to the throne room of grace to request more grace and mercy to help in time of need. And where sin abounds, grace is greater. But that's not applicable when I'm living a perpetual lifestyle of sin and unrighteousness. You can't turn something that's beautiful, grace, into something that's gross. And this is how they're living their life. They're declaring, as long as their sacrificial system is intact, as long as they're making their way to the temple, as long as they come to church, as long as they tithe, as long as they serve, Whatever they do on Monday to Saturday, God's grace is enough. That is called pseudo-salvation, fake. And there's plenty of people in the church right now who are sitting in their sin thinking they're good with God, but they've never actually repented. And the Lord is purging his church, and his Holy Spirit is literally purifying his bride See, it's incompatible to claim that Christ brought sin to an end and then live as if sin is still a friend. Sin is an enemy, a mortal enemy. Christ waged war against your sin and my sin and was victorious and the Bible declares in 1 Corinthians 15, he took, he took the sting out of sin and death. So 
So to live a life that goes back to the vomit after Christ laid down his life to save me from it? Oh no, it is incompatible to know that God bought you while still living as if sin owns you. Again, I am not saying we're not gonna wrestle and struggle with sin. While we are on planet Earth, wrapped in our flesh, this body of death is going to war against my spiritual man. But I know that. So I put in place checks and balances on the flesh through a, through a fellowship, accountability here, through devotions and reading the word, through prayer life, through fasting to submit this body of death. Because God bought me. God purchased you, church. You were bought at a price. You are invaluable. God appraised you priceless. When he went to that cross and made you righteous. Do you understand something? Jewelers receive diamonds from all over the world and they put them under their microscope and they cut them with such precision so that the clarity of that diamond and the estimation of its worth and it's appraised and we even go out of our way to get certificates that show how much this diamond is worth just in case I lose it and I got insurance on it. And that's good and grand if you got all that, but I'm simply saying we go through such great lengths to understand value and worth. And yet, none of that compares to the value and worth of your life. And Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Wow. The same progressive sins were occurring in Jeremiah's day as Paul's day. Progressive-ism. They were transgressing beyond the boundaries of the Bible and claiming that God's grace could still save them even though they were living in immorality, to which Paul was like, it's not just about your spirit being saved. Your body is also the temple of the Lord, to which we quote verses like, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that your life may prove that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. But you can't get to verse two in Romans 12, two, without walking through Romans chapter 12, verse one. I implore you, I beseech you, by the mercies of God, you've been estimated priceless. That you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice. Here I am, another Thursday night, Lord, putting my life back on the altar. This past week I struggled, I've sinned. And you know it. But I'm putting my life back on the altar as a living sacrifice, holy, and he makes it holy acceptable to you, which is my reasonable, worshipful service. Verse 11, Jeremiah, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Remember, he's in the gates. He's outside of the temple court. God is saying, have you turned this place into a den of thieves? Behold, I even I have seen it, says the Lord. Remember, they're hiding behind the temple. There's no way God will judge them as long as the temple stood in the land. This reference to a den of thieves, it's basically claiming that they made the house of the Lord into a safe place for spiritual thievery. A den of thieves, a den is, you have a den in your home likely. It's the place where you might go and watch some television. It's your comfortable abode. It's the place where you are isolated. You're secluded. It's like, it's your den. Hey, welcome to my den. The den of thieves was a place or a cave where after they just robbed and pillaged, they would go to a secure location where they would count the booty, but it was their den. It was the den of thieves. They were, listen to me, they were comfortable there. How 
in the world can the house of the Lord become a den of thieves? That's why Jesus in Matthew 21, watch this, verse 12 and 13. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Verse 13, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Okay, he took that from Isaiah 56, verse seven. Isaiah says, the house of the Lord, the house of prayer to all nations, that's what it's supposed to be about, to all people. And then, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus pulled that from Jeremiah 7, 11. I love that because it just shows you how Jesus had a working knowledge and a handle on the word. It makes sense, he was the word, but he was still using Old Testament prophecies and scriptures to make application where he was. He called it a den of thieves in his time. All right, I wonder, I wonder, is that still happening today? Has God's church, the people who are his temple, have places of worship, houses of prayer become nothing more than den of thieves? I don't know. The way to know that would be whether or not places like this, physical places, even though we're spiritual temples together, if a spiritual thief would be comfortable in these seats. What do I mean by that? I mean somebody that's offended by bloody Jesus. They feel safe here, they wanna feel safe. Even though on Saturday night, they're gonna live however they want. Because Sunday, they're gonna check the box. I'll tell you the, the one thing I do know in my calling is the church of Jesus Christ is not supposed to be a den of thieves. It's not supposed to be a place where you can be a spiritual thief and feel comfortable without conviction here. Can't happen. Because God is always purging his church. And he's purging us because he wants a pure bride. See, it is, the church is never to be a safe haven for spiritual thieves. What is the church then? The church is to be a, a safe for spiritual truth. Heaven safe, like a safety deposit box, like a place of security for truth. Like a place when you're here, truth prevails. Truth and love live, and grace and mercy, and conviction and comfort, and all simultaneously working out of the word of God. So you come in, but you leave different than you came. Some of us need the joy of the Lord to be our strength. Some of us need the comfort of the Holy Spirit while we're mourning and grieving, and all of it happens in this place. And prayer is lifted up in this place. But one thing you can't do in this place is come in habitual sin and think you're safe with God to the shame of his name. I'm not talking about somebody coming in, I deal with it all the time, people are struggling. I want them to come to me as a shepherd and I wanna walk them through the scriptures or I wanna counsel them or encourage them. I believe my testimony lends itself. My door is always open for people that struggle but not somebody that knows they're living in sin and they think they can come sit in the seats and not have the word confront them. No, the church is not a refuge for rebels. The church is a refuge for the redeemed. You know what happens right after Jesus overturns the tables and purges the temple? Matthew 21, verse 14. I think I missed it, I don't know. Just, it's one of those times where you're reading, you're like, I never saw that verse. Jesus just gets done saying, it is written, my house shall not be called a den of thieves or it shall not be a den of thieves. You've turned it into that, it's a house of prayer. Verse 14, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The blind, those that couldn't see, the lame, those that couldn't walk, the paralyzed, 
In other words, he got rid of all the fluff and all the stuff and all the distractions and all the thievery and all the manipulation and all the conniving and all the entertainment and all the showiness and all the fakeness. And that's when healing could fall on the people. People could finally see straight. People could finally walk out their Christianity when the temple was purged. That's when the Holy Spirit begins to work. That's what he's doing in his church globally right now. He is purging his bride. Verse 12, but go now to my place, God says, which was in Shiloh, different location, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. So he's speaking about Judah's sister, the northern kingdom, namely Israel, and he's saying to them, because you have done all these things, these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer, therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name and which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. All right. Shiloh was a central city in northern Israel. It was the first place where the people of God gathered. It was the first place where the tabernacle of meeting was constructed. Did you know that? In Shiloh. So we often think about Jerusalem, but before Jerusalem was Shiloh. And that is where the northern tribes were able to do religious business. And it's where the tabernacle of meeting and the altar of the Lord were first erected. I know that from Joshua chapter 18, verse one. Let me read it. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there. And the land was subdued before them. The Lord gave them the land with Joshua. Remember it, they go into Canaan. They overthrow the cities. And it's in Shiloh where God establishes a temple of sorts. It was called the tabernacle of meeting. Before the monstrosity of the physical temple, it was like a tent. They would pack it up and put it together everywhere they went. And God is saying to Jeremiah to tell the people, hey, you remember Shiloh? And they thought they were secure and safe because they had the tabernacle of meeting and my altar was set up there. Yeah, that doesn't even exist anymore. It's desolate. The Philistines attacked the northern kingdom once the Assyrians, about 100 years before Jeremiah, that is why in a previous message we, lock, we looked at history. And when history is not heated, history will be repeated. And they are in the very place where history is about to repeat itself. From Shiloh to Jerusalem, to the tabernacle of meeting of the past, to the temple of the present, Remember, a nation will rise or fall based on whether or not it follows God's law. And to dismiss God's law is to completely miss God's heart. Second Chronicles 69, one of my favorite verses, says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. Wait, God's eyes scanning billions of people looking for a singular heart who's loyal to his cause. And he says he's gonna stand behind that gal or that guy. To which Romans 8.31 would be applicable, right? God is for you because your heart is for his cause. Who can be against you? I want that. I want the stature of God to represent this church and the Christians therein. Because the stature of God stands behind the person or people who abide by the statutes of God. Psalm 119, 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I shall keep it to the end. I shall follow your way. I shall trust in your word. I shall desire your will. Like the temple of old, Jesus, come upon my heart, overthrow anything that is in your way, purge me from the inside out, for I am your temple. I say that prayer for me and you and us. 
The world needs to see Christians like a landmark. That's what the Statue of Liberty represents. In Ellis Island, can't miss it, Lady Liberty is holding forth a torch. So with that in mind, I think that the church and the Christian should also hold forth a torch, but that torch is truth. And as Paul said, hold forth the word of life. And if I do that as a statue, people see me and my life, it's because I'm living off the statutes of liberty and the word of God. And that's where revival begins, on our knees. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. By God's grace tonight, let's do it. Let's pray. So Father, as your people, we declare that we are your body, we are your temple, so do as you please. Come upon us, come within us, overthrow anything that is keeping us from you. We give you full access here, Holy Spirit. Begin to purge your people, your church, like Jeremiah's message came forth at the gates of the temple. Here we are sitting in a temple of sorts declaring this place to be a house of prayer, no longer a den of thieves. So have your way, because we know it is in Christ alone. It's in Christ alone we build our lives. It's in Christ alone we build our homes. It's in Christ alone we build our marriages, our families, our communities. So we hold forth that word, asking for you to draw people to yourself. And ultimately, make much of yourself through these people and your church. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray, amen.